I'll stay down here. I'm, I'm afraid of heights. Uh, well, thank you all for coming. This is fantastic. I want to thank um, all the sponsors, uh, but I especially want to thank uh, Belmont Savings Bank, because that's where I had my first bank account ever. Who's from Belmont Savings Bank? Yeah. All right. <laughs> thank you. So I, you know, I do this all over the country and the world, actually. Um, uh, but I live in Boston. I live in Brookline. And I grew up in Belmont. And, um, you know, this area is very near and dear to my heart, uh, but I've almost done no work uh, in the Boston area. Uh, I moved back here with my family uh, about two and a half years ago. And uh, it's strange to be kind of putting my foot in the water in this neighborhood because um, consultants tend to be valued as a function of how far they've flown. And um, so this is strange that I'm, I'm working here. But in any case... Um, I, I give kind of, uh, well, all my talks are, these days are on the topic of my book, which is The Walkable City, and I give two types of talks. I was asked to kind of put them together today, which is tough, but I will, uh, I will do that, and I give talks about why we need our cities to be more walkable and about how to make our cities uh, more walkable. I'm going to talk a little bit about the first topic, uh, but I would direct you to my TED Talk, on this subject, if you want more of this. Uh, or actually, just when we're done, just sprint to the back of the room and make sure you get one of the books. Because this talk is actually, I kind of like, my book was, uh, I figured out the best way to say all the things that I like to say or need to say on these issues. And then I wrote them down, and then that became the book. And then I memorized the book, and then that became the talk. So in fact, you just have to read the book. <laughs> but maybe it's better to see it on screen. Um, but this, uh, very briefly, this is the story really about how I, as a city planner, with my colleagues in the new urbanism movement, spent, spent many years, you know, my bosses before me, my, my colleagues before me, uh, and, and, and I, for many years, used urbanist arguments, planning arguments, aesthetic arguments about why our city should be more, more, more walkable. And that, you know, that was kind of the backbone of the new, new urbanist movement for a couple decades. And clearly the movement had a big impact, but it was fascinating about 15 years ago to realize that there were these three other groups that were essentially arguing for the same things that we were arguing for in their own terms and getting much more attention and much more, I would say, positive outcomes than we as planners were getting by addressing it as planners. And those three groups were the economists, the environmentalists, and the epidemiologists. And so actually the first part of my book, and now the arguments that I use in communities to encourage people to invest in making themselves more walkable, are these arguments that we've learned uh, from these groups. The economic argument is um, a little bit scary. <coughs> in, in, in 1970, the typical American dedicated about 10% uh, of their income to transportation. Now, between 1970 and 2010, we about doubled the number of roads in our country. We decided that we were going to orient ourselves around the car as the principal way of getting around. And that's had a lot of impacts, but the, probably the principal impact it's had on us is now the typical American spends 20% of their income on transportation. So we've burdened ourselves with this very expensive way of getting around. And we've demanded, I would say, excess mobility of ourselves. It's not just how we get around, but the fact that everything is separated, and so we're always moving from thing to thing. So that's half of it, all the motion that we have to undergo. But the fact that we're doing it in cars, which are almost entirely single occupancy uh, most of the time, means that now we have to spend so much more of our wealth on driving, and I should say just on transportation. According to uh, the... Um, uh, you know, the, the federal government, the typical working American, that's a, a term, working American, even though we all work, uh, is dedicating a, as much on transportation as they are to housing from their income. And the typical poor American is spending 40% of their income on transportation. So anything we can do to make that less of a burden is a positive thing. Additionally, it's not just what we're paying, but it's what society is paying. There are, there are all these hidden costs behind driving. And people talk about transit subsidy and roadway investment. But, of course, you could flip those terms around. Um, it's really all investment and it's all subsidy one way or another. But how much is it? Now, 
This chart, I'm sure, is not all that accurate. These things never are. But some economists, you know, put some pencils to some paper, and they calculate that, for example, if, walk, if you spend a dollar to walk, now I'm not sure how you would do that. Maybe that's sneakers or something. But if you spend a dollar to walk, then society has to contribute a penny for sidewalks and that sort of thing. Um, but if you take a bus, it costs society, every dollar you spend is matched by, you know, money that's coming from general taxation and other sources at a rate of 150 to 1. Uh, and this calculation says that driving is $9 for every dollar you spend. And that's, that's paying for highways, paying for policing, paying for, um, you know, all the costs associated. And I believe this measurement also includes externalities such as pollution, time wasted in traffic. But the point is that we've, we've actually created a landscape in which we as individuals and society as a whole are just wasting a ton of money on mobility. That's part of the economic argument, and I don't have time for the rest. The environmentalist argument, uh, you know, becomes clearer and clearer every day. The recent footage from the hurricanes that we've been seeing is just astounding. I've had to replace all my pictures um, with, with um, newer, more tragic uh, images. Um, but we know, you know, those of us who believe in science, or I should say, people say, do you believe in climate change? I say, no, I acknowledge climate change. This isn't whether you believe it or not. Those of us who acknowledge science understand <coughs> that we are causing this to happen. And what's fascinating is to have watched the environmentalist movement, which in the U.S. has traditionally been an anti-city movement, to totally change its orientation. And that happened when we started mapping carbon. But not when we, actually, not when we started mapping carbon. This is Chicago. This is a typical carbon map. And the way we used to map carbon is that the, the, uh, we'd map it in, in um, uh, pounds per, per, pounds of CO2 emitted per square mile. And when you map carbon per square mile, what you find is that the carbon maps look like the night sky maps of the U.S., right? They're brightest in the cities, duller in the suburbs, and pitch black in the countryside. And that sends a very strong message, which is that, you know, cities are bad and the country is good. And then someone very smart asked the question, is that the right way to map carbon? And realized we shouldn't be mapping carbon per square mile. We should be mapping it per household because we have, we have the choice to live wherever we want. So maybe we could live in places where we would have a, a smaller footprint. And when you map carbon per household, and you can do this for any city, and this map exists for Boston, the further you are from the city center, the worse your footprint is. And so actually the environmentalist movement has turned on a dime in the past 15 years or so and said, you know, we humans are a destructive species. The best thing you can do if you love nature is to stay the hell away from it and focus your, li your living in cities where you will have a smaller footprint because of all of the alternative ways of living more denser and, and on transit that cities, cities provide so many people. And of course, you know, the fuel companies are quick to jump in and say, oh, we have to save the environment. So even Chevron, this is like McDonald's having an ad saying, I will not eat meat, right? But Chevron saying, I will leave the car at home. But, you know, most of America looks like this and you don't have the option to leave the car at home. So it's a tough situation. And then finally, in terms of uh, the American health crises we face, which is principally an obesity challenge. Um, the, I, I like to say the best day to be a planner um, was August 7th, 2004, when this book came out. And, you know, we'd been shouting into the wind for so long about the mo social impacts of sprawl versus compact urban development. But these these two epidemiologists and a planner came out with this book and basically said, our pattern of growth is making us sick as a nation. Guess which one's the planner? It's the cute one. <laughs> but they came out with this book, and this book basically said, you know, um, we have a lot of problems as a society um, in, in our health, and most of them are a function of the fact that we're not eating well, but we've been focusing for so long on diet, and we haven't been focusing on, you know, calories out. And what we've done is, by the way that we've designed our landscape, we've actually, actually engineered out of existence the useful walk. And so, you know, this is a slide I got from one of these doctors, and we've been showing this for 15 years, but the idea that you could, you could walk 
you know, you could drive to the parking lot to park to take the escalator to the gym to get on the treadmill in order to get some exercise shows we've kind of fundamentally misengineered our country. So, uh, and then th they, they cite a bunch of different studies, and I apologize for all the words, but this is Boston. And one of the studies they found, they studied 100,000 different people in Boston, and basically the further you got from Boston, the more out of shape you were. And it was a function of essentially how long your commute was and the fact that you were probably spending a lot of time uh, in your car. And so both it was all the sitting and then, of course, the time that you didn't have to do all the things that a, a long commute causes you uh, to, d to do. So um, uh, interesting to see evidence from Boston. But there's a new term that they came up with, which is now a common term in the medical field called obesogenic. Said so basically the suburbs outside of 495 are obesogenic suburbs. We're close in, so hopefully we're, we're in better shape. And then car crashes, of course. This man being interviewed, like, right after his accident, um, is a, uh, you know, I have a funny slide, but it's actually an incredibly tragic piece of data that we never talk about, that we lost 40,000 lives last year in car crashes. And what's interesting is you look at different cities. Boston's one of the safest. You know, in Boston, I think we lose about six people per 100,000 per year in car crashes. In, in uh, you know, Oklahoma City, it's closer to, to 20. You know, from six to 20. When we're both in cities, but the way the city is designed, whether it's a more walkable city or it's a more driving and high-speed driving city, is the principal determinant. There's other factors as well, asthma, which has tripled in 30 years because of car pollution and other things. But these arguments are very powerful ones, and I've found that they're, um, they've been most instrumental, particularly in most of the places I work, uh, particularly the economic arguments um, in convincing people to want to make change within their communities. So that's the talk. I hope you will see it, because this was a short and bad version of that talk. Um, let's talk about how to do it, because that's really what I'm here to speak about and what I think is most useful for you. Um, and we begin with this uh, assumption, if you believe the first part of my talk, <laughs> that walkable places are thriving places. And we ask then, how do you get people to walk? And that leads to what I call my general theory of walkability, which is a little tongue-in-cheek, but it is a theory, which means, you know, it's a hypothesis which has been constantly refined with more and more evidence. And what the general theory of walkability says, which is the kind of framework of the rest of my book, um, is that in America, in which driving is so cheap, for what it's worth, and, and so easy, and the car is sitting in the driveway, typically, between you and everything, and it's just so easy to fall into the car, and in fact, if you own an American sedan, four-fifths of the cost of driving that car are just owning the car, and one-fifth is driving the car. The fixed costs are huge. The marginal costs are very small. So there's all this motivation to drive as much as you can, and every mile costs less than the mile before it. In these circumstances, if you're going to get people to walk, the walk has to be as good as the drive. It's simple. But for the walk to be as good as the drive, it has to do four things simultaneously. And if it doesn't do all four of these things, people will not choose to, those people with a choice will not choose to walk. The walk has to be useful, the walk has to be safe, the walk has to be comfortable, and the walk has to be interesting. And that's the structure of the rest of my talk uh, this evening. The reason to walk is a story I learned from my mentors, the founders of the New Urbanist Movement, Andre Stuani and Elizabeth Plater Zyberg. Andres used to give this talk called The Story of Planning, and he talked about how in the 19th century the people were choking on the soot from the dark satanic mills, and the planners, who weren't then called planners, um, said, hey, what if we separate the housing from the factories? And they did that, you know, with the Garden City movement, and of course, lifespans increased immediately and dramatically, and the planners were hailed as heroes, and we like to say they've been trying to repeat that experience ever since. So you have the onset of Euclidean zoning, the separation of the landscape into large areas of single use. We're very fortunate here in New England that so much of our landscape was developed before this became the standard model. But we now know, you know, if you go to planning school now, they teach you that this is wrong, that this guarantees an unwalkable unhealthy outcome to have just huge blotches of single use. But most of the time when I go somewhere to do a plan, there's a plan on the site already that looks like this. So most of America already has this hidden DNA of unwalkability in it because of this segregation 
of use from use. And of course, you know, I was an art history major, which they say is a bad idea as a major, but I can tell you, you don't want a um, Rothko, you want a Seurat, right? Seurat was the pointillist. And the higher, the, the greater, um, uh, more like confetti, the more confetti-like, the finer the grain of the zoning, if you're going to zone by use, the more walkable a place you're going to have. And of course, this isn't a zoning map. This is simply a map of existing uses in our most walkable, statistically our most walkable city. And it's even a little misleading because the red you see in much of it, particularly in the middle, is vertically mixed use. So you have different uses on top of each other. This is what makes for a, a truly walkable place. Which leads me to kind of the fundamental new urbanist, new urbanist argument. And if you've heard this before from Andre Stuani, for example, you can forgive me, but I never go anywhere without saying this. Who knows where this is? It's Newburyport. Um, we show this all around the world. We've been showing it for 30 years all around the world. The fundamental new ur urbanist argument goes like this. There are only two tested ways to design and build communities throughout history and around the world. And one is the traditional neighborhood here represented by Newburyport. It's defined as being compact, walkable, and um, diverse. Not diverse necessarily in terms of who's there, although we hope it will be, but it's diverse in planning terms in terms of use. So you have places to live, places to work, places to worship, places to shop, places to recreate, all within walking distance. It's walkable because there's many streets, so no one street needs to be that big. Um, and the typical neighborhood's about a five minute walk from edge to center, and we find that across cultures and throughout history. The other model, now there's a million ways to make a town, but there's only one other way that we've tested by the thousands, and that's sprawl, suburban sprawl, which clearly, as the name tells you, is not compact. Um, it's not diverse. Whole square miles might just hold one use, or in this case, one house, over and over again. Um, and it's not walkable because so few of the streets actually connect anywhere, right? You've got loops and cul-de-sacs, and most streets don't go anywhere. So those few that do become sized around moving all the automobiles. And they're designed around the sole criteria of moving as many cars as possible as quickly as they can. We call them automotive sewers. And you can see the houses turn their backs to them. There's walls. There's not a single address on this road because it's so noxious, right? So it's fun to break sprawl down into its constituent parts, the places where you only live, where you only work, where you only shop. Uh, school supersized around the assumption of, um, of everyone driving there. Uh, the parking lot bigger than the school is what you often see. Uh, and even playing facilities. You know, there's this tendency among schools and among recreational facilities to, to consolidate. But the bigger a school is or the bigger a park is, the further away it is. Think about that. Right? When I grew up in Belmont, you know, there were no soccer moms when I was a kid. You know, my mom didn't work. But she never had to take us anywhere because I had access on foot to two soccer fields and two baseball diamonds and three tennis courts, right? Not, not eight of each, but they were in my neighborhood. And I did, the, I did the math. You can't see it, but it's actually from this house to this field is a two-mile two drive around the cul-de-sacs. So the one part we forgot to count when we separated everything from everything else and then reconnected it only with automotive infrastructure is the highways, which, of course have gone from being tools of commerce and vacation travel to just commuting ways, and we need them for our society to function. Uh, I always tell people it's a two-part deal, right? You can, you can have this. For many, this is the American dream, but it, com it comes with that. And you can't have one without the other. Often to absurd extremes. This is in the Boston area. I forgot where this is. Does anyone know where this is? Shout it if you know it. I think it's like in Malden or... Where? Square. In Medford. It's in Medford. Um, but, you know, the amount we invest in our horizontal infrastructure so you never have to wait more than one light cycle. You know, instead of spending money on schools this is, and, you know, beautiful civic buildings, this is where our society chooses to spend its money. The experience can be very frustrating. This is not Photoshop. Uh, it's stressful on families, all the commuting that you have to do. You know, the, the longer your commute, the more likely you are to be divorced. That's true. Although people have more affairs in cities than in the suburbs, which is also an interesting statistic. But 
this is stressful. Driving is no fun, and um, being a pedestrian can be even worse. So these are the two models. And there's less pressure here in New England for me to show these than most places I work because, again, we're so well-developed and we're so well-entrenched in this neighborhood model. But the point here is it's the same stuff. It's places to live, work, get educated, shop. But how big is it? And is it a cul-de-sac off a collector or is it in a street network? Because that's the distinction. It's not just mixing the uses, but it's having them in a traditional network of small blocks. And, ooh, there's my picture again. This is, this is Needham Center, right? And we'd like the blocks to be smaller, but you can see that throughout New England, um, this model is the standard model that's developed so many of our, of our downtowns, including the wonderful villages of Newton that, uh, you know, they're not, they're not walking distance of every home, but they're pretty close to every home. And that's one of the things that makes Newton more valuable, as we'll discuss later. Uh, the other part, another part, another big part of the useful walk, which we're finishing up here, is, of course, transit. Because uh, we like to live in more than just our own little neighborhoods. Uh, we'd like to live without a car. If we're going to make the choice to live without a car, then we need to get from the different walkable places from them to each other. And if your walkable places are connected by transit, then you can make that choice not to own the car. And, of course, there's a lot of people, fully a third of Americans don't drive, um, for different reasons, too old, too young, infirm, not enough money. But for those people, of course, transit is absolutely essential. So the useful walk is a transit discussion as much as it is a um, land use discussion. And, of course, it's the opportunities like you see here, again, in Needham Center, where you have a transit station and a train track that could hopefully get better service and more frequent service and more friendly service. Um, and you see this, I did a, a number of designs on the Long Island Railroad um, in New York, and it's the surface parking lot at the train station that is the great future development site. And what you see happening all over the U.S. is these are turning from surface parking into structured parking and becoming surrounded by housing and other uses. And these are your most valuable opportunities. Uh, and then, of course, <coughs> let's not forget buses. They're not as glamorous as trains. They might be as glamorous as the train I just showed you, but um, the, uh, you know, the workhorse of most of our transit service in the, in the, in the U.S. Is, uh, is buses, and, and Boston service, which I grew up using, is one of the better services, despite some recent disappointments. Um, that's the first category, the reason to walk. The se second category, the safe walk, is the biggest one, and we're going to spend most of our time on this category. Um, the safe walk is principally not about crime anymore. It's about having a fighting chance against being hit by a car. And key to everything I'm going to talk about, and this took us a while to figure out, but key to everything I'm going to mention is the speed of the vehicle and what the environment does to influence the speed of the driver. You're like five times as likely to die being hit at 35 as you are at 25. And that's the threshold on either side of which many vehicles are driving in our cities, and anything we can do to bring it down lower is going to make everyone safer, drivers as well. So the first issue is how many lanes of traffic do we provide? And yes, this is an issue for highways, but it's also an issue for city streets, places like Oklahoma City where um, I did a plan after this was built, <laughs> not before. Um, and uh, the the... the issue is, you know, how many lanes do you need to handle your traffic? And in New England, at least at rush hour, you almost never see a scene like this. What you see is a scene like this. And I, I didn't go hunting for this. I was just on Google, and this is in downtown Needham, and uh, the, the line, like, never ends, these cars all waiting here. And this is the experience in much of New England, and it's the experience, of course, that we've had in cities all around the U.S., but particularly our older, denser cities with narrower streets. And the impulse always is like, well, what if we remove the parallel parking and dedicate that other, other lane to, another, to more vehicles? Won't that solve our problem? And the other message I make a point of sharing everywhere I go is that we will not solve that problem by adding more lanes because of what's called the fundamental law of congestion. And forgive me if you heard this before, but it's so important. And the better you know it, the more you can become an advocate for this uh, discussion. But... This is ideal traffic planning, 
And this still happens in most places where this gap represents the difference between uh, the amount of cars on the street and the capacity of the street. And when yellow exceeds purple, what we get is congestion, and we believe that by doubling the number of lanes, for example, you can absorb that congestion and you will no longer, you can absorb that traffic and you'll no longer have congestion. But what happens instead is this, and it's called induced traffic, and it always happens. And the reason it happens is because, this is, here's the key sentence, in congested systems, the principal constraint to driving is congestion. You think about it. Congestion is the principal way that we're made to pay in our driving lives. You know, gas is cheap. Cars are cheap. Congestion is expensive. We spend a lot of time and money driving. And the thing that's going to make you decide whether or not to take a trip, whether to carpool, where to live, whether to ride a bike or not, often it, more, more than any other factor, it's whether you're going to be stuck in traffic. So when the traffic goes away... People make that decision to move further from work or to not carpool or principally maybe just to commute right on peak and not off peak. And the congestion comes back. Uh, <clears throat> this is Newsweek magazine. Today's engineers acknowledge that building new roads usually makes traffic worse. Unfortunately, most engineers who make decisions don't acknowledge that yet. Uh, so they say you've got to widen the road and then you widen the road and the traffic comes and they say, see, I told you that that traffic was coming. But, of course, it's the widening that induces the traffic. This is the study that documents it. Very straightforward. Actually, I have no idea what this means. But I do know what this means, which is like every, lane, every new lane you introduce is immediately 40% congested with new trips. And within four years, it's 100% congested with new trips, which is why things like the um, 405 freeway expansion in L.A. or the Katy Freeway in Houston, they spend tons of money widening it, and then the congestion is just as bad. If not immediately, then shortly thereafter. The next thing I want to talk about, you know, I forgot to mention, of course, the number of lanes. It, it's pretty obvious. The more lanes there are, the less safe you are, because cars go faster. It looks more like a highway. You have more lanes to cross. Anything you can do to reduce the number of lanes makes the streets safer. Wouldn't it be great if we could do that without congesting traffic worse than it was, which leads me to this really wonderful trick that you're going to hear more about in the video, which we've been threatening with you with. There will be a video. Um, but this is called the classic American road diet, where you take a four-lane road and you narrow it to three lanes. Now, a four-lane road is very dangerous because the passing lane is also the speeding lane, and you take this left because this guy stopped and that guy hits you, and you've, you know, these are the most dangerous streets we have. And when you narrow it to three lanes, it becomes much, much safer. And you also gain room for something like, say, two bike lanes. Now, of course, no one's surprised when injuries drop. And this happens a lot. These have been done all over the U.S. Um, what surprises everyone is this data, which shows these are 23 different classic American road diets, four lanes to three lanes. The number of cars going through the street before and after are essentially the same. It actually went up a little bit. So the miraculous thing is you, you, you gain safety, you gain bike lanes or parking or something else, but you don't lose any capacity. And so that's why these are spreading all over the U.S., and there are many candidates for them, particularly here. Washington Street is the obvious one that I know um, in this area, and that's why we've been focusing on Washington Street in our work. But it's a classic four-lane road that would carry just as many cars as a three-lane road. Next is the width of the lanes. Andres Duane used to joke that the typical road to the typical subdivision in America now allows you to witness the curvature of the earth. And it's because the, the standards just keep shifting and widening. This is a 1960s subdivision. This is a 1980s subdivision. And look at the difference. Same height of airplane, but look at the streets. The standards just have creeped wider and wider. My old neighborhood in South Beach, when it wasn't draining properly, they had to rebuild the curbs, but they built it to the new standards. So we lose half our sidewalks, we lose our trees, and these are um, uh, standards that are all over the U.S. now. So, you know, of course, what happens on a wider street? We know that people go faster on wider streets. Here's the data. As the street widens, the speeds go up. Here's another uh, analysis. As the street goes from 10 feet wide to 12 feet wide, the severity of impact of crashes is multiplied by 10, roughly. Increased lane would cause a lot of deaths. We've known this for so many years, and I, this is where I ask, you know, how long before our society corrects itself? 
And the answer is that it's correcting itself now. Uh, you know, citizens have been demanding narrow streets in their communities. Portland, always ahead, Portland, Oregon, with it, has a skinny streets program in the city. Uh, and then when we build new subdivisions or new communities, we don't call them subdivisions because they're mixed use and they're walkable. We, we fight the rules. This is ION, a project I helped build in um, Mount Pleasant near Charleston, South Carolina. And the developer of this is a guy named Vince Graham, and he, he's a very good speaker. And he goes to conferences and he shows his classic, this is a two-way street, very narrow streets, tiny, tiny rights of way. And he quotes this philosopher who says, broad is the road that leads to destruction, narrow is the road that leads to life. And this plays very well in the South, as you might imagine. <laughs> um, but here's what really happened, which was about a year or so ago, NACTO, the National Association of City Transportation Officials, says it, te said it, lanes of 10 feet. Now, this is not in a, sub in, a, in a low density place where you can have narrow lanes like the ones I showed you, right? But this is like urban lanes in New York City, in Boston, in Newton, in Needham. Urban shopping streets can have 10 foot lanes. It's an appropriate width. That used to be the standard. Many cities now use 11 and 12 or wider. Here on Washington Street, actually, I measured the lanes. You know, so this one's narrower than that one. It's a 12 and a half foot lane. And you find these all around the place. So um, here, uh, Highland, this is interesting. Google transitions in dates. So I'm hoping this is the older Google and this is the newer Google. Um, as you move down the street, it looks that way. And this lane is much too wide. And what someone did when it was time to restripe Highland Ave was to create a bike lane. It's only one. You know, there's, there's not a partner. I often do this. People say, where's the, where's the opposing bike lane? Well, there was only room for one. But having that one bike lane makes the lanes the proper width. And bike facilities are a great tool for making lanes the right width. And we stick them in whenever we can when we find excess space in a road. Like right here in Needham Center, this should be 20 feet, 10 feet and 10 feet, but it's 37 feet. So there's room for like a whole, you know, bicycle stunt park or something in this street. Uh, and bicycles are, I like to say, if you're a planner, you know, I mean, bicycling is the biggest revolution, you know, in America happening in only some American cities. And some are investing in it more and more are. Some aren't doing anything for bicycles. Those, those that are are getting a lot of attention. This is Portland again, Oregon, famous biking city. And what Portland did was they invested about $60 million in cycling over about 20, 25 years. And they went from biking the same amount as everyone else to biking about 15 times as much as everyone else. And I asked my friend Tom Brennan of, of Nelson Nygaard to send me some pictures of bicycling in Portland. And he sent me these pictures. I said, what, was this bike to work day? He said, no, it's Tuesday in Portland because they invested in cycling. And it's investment in cycling infrastructure like this lane in Chicago, protected bike lane, that creates a cycling population. There's lots of different things you can do to hope for more cyclists, but there's nothing that will get you more cyclists like simply investing in what's called a low-stress bicycle network, a bike network that's protected, in this case, by parked cars that have been pulled off the curb. This is called a cycle track or a protected bike lane. Um, they came back and they striped it green, very successful in Chicago. We have some in Boston. You're probably aware of it. These have come to the area. Um, my friend and colleague, Jason Schreiber of Nelson Nygaard, uh, has been one person responsible for this. And uh, it's wonderful to see it here. We don't seem to park as well in Boston uh, in the buffer. But um, uh, he, the, the data is really powerful. This is um, Prospect Avenue West, Prospect Park West in Brooklyn. And they went from a three lane <coughs> to a two lane. And of course, you know, the number of cyclists tripled when they introduced this beautiful protected bike facility. Um, speeding went from 75% of all New Yorkers <laughs> to 17%. We're no better. Um, injury crashes dropped 63%. But amazingly, car volume and trip times did not change. Because basically what was happening in the three-laner was they were just speeding from red to red. So no less capacity than before. Again, of course there was a lawsuit, this being New York. 
But eventually the bike-hating NIMBY trolls grudgingly surrendered to reality. Um, and look how safe and comfortable this, this girl looks in this lane. And clearly, you know, this is a sweet photo, but it's not the same thing with the door there and the cars there. This is in Washington, D.C. The, the, one, the, the first problem is getting doored. The second problem, particularly now that everyone's shopping by Amazon, is all the, the trucks in the lane. You know, you know this if you cycle. The lane's always, something's always in the lane. You know, I don't know why this is in the lane. But something's always in the lane. So, you know, I tell people this isn't a cult. Uh, cities, tech, tech gurus, employers, you know, firms that employ young people are very interested in having better bicycle facilities. And everyone says, oh, you know, bike lanes. Who, this guy doesn't need a bike lane. You know, this is what most people think of when they think of cyclists. It's called the, the mammal, the middle-aged man in Lycra, right? But the... <laughs> The, this is not, I t always tell cities, this is not your target cyclist. This is your target cyclist. And in most of our cities, actually, this is the person who's going to benefit the most. Many more of our cyclists are lower income, uh, statistically. So people are caring about equity in planning, and then a bicycle lane is about the best thing you can do. Um, and, of course, this is, this is a part of, of Newton. Um, the bike routes are well laid out. Right? We all know where people do bike and where they want to bike and where we want to see them bike, but the low-stress bike network that's going to make them choose to bike isn't necessarily there yet. <clears throat> Next, so we're running down the list, right, of all the things that make our streets safe. Next, and often forgotten, is parallel parking. Parallel parking is a buffer of steel that protects the sidewalk from moving vehicles. You cannot have a very good dining, say, dining sidewalk without parallel parking. I said that for years, and then I discovered in Fort Lauderdale, this happy hour afternoon, you can see you're allowed to park on this side of the street and not on that side of the street. And this is happy hour on the parked side, and this is happy hour on the not parked side. Because no one, I didn't stage this, right? No one wants to be next to the cars without that buffer protecting them. And then street trees are the final part of this picture, and a very important um, aspect of, str of streets for so many reasons, and I dedicated a whole chapter of my book to all the amazing things that street trees do, but they also, you know, they slow cars down. They actually, a street with trees causes cars to move more slowly. The studies were done, particularly in Orlando, and found that street trees slow cars down, sometimes dramatically, but <laughs> better that they hit a tree than they hit a pedestrian. And an artist, a European artist, made this picture of what a street feels like without the trees, without the parallel parking, uh, when you're walking on that sidewalk. I have to say this. I don't always show this slide, but because I'm in Boston, the, Boston is upsetting to me because I go around the world and I say, walkable cities don't have push-button lights, push-button signals. And it's true for everywhere except Boston. And it's unfortunate. The, the signal timing in this city, in Brookline, I can't speak for Newton or Needham, um, the, the way the push buttons work, the way the signals work, is absolutely befuddling and frustrating. It makes you stay home and, and drive next time. And we really have to eliminate push buttons from our, you know, except for extreme conditions like major highways, the push button is not a part of a walkable city. That's it. That's the big category. Now we're getting into the final and last two categories of the comfortable walk and the interesting walk. The comfortable walk is, in some ways, very counterintuitive. We Americans like our wide open spaces. We like climbing hills and getting big views. But actually, the evolutionary biologists tell us that all animals, humans among them, are simultaneously seeking prospect and refuge. So you want to be able to see your predators, but you also need to feel that your flanks are covered from attack. And if you don't have that feeling of enclosure, that lets you know that your flanks are covered, then actually you don't feel comfortable in a space, which is why our favorite spaces have great edges and why when you lose that edge, particularly if something appears like a parking lot, you no longer feel comfortable in a space. So we've been talking about this for a long time. You know, what's the right ratio of height to width? One to one is the Renaissance ideal. Three to one, great. Beyond one to six, you kind of lose your sense of enclosure. Trees, of course, help. You know, six to one, this is Salzburg, can be absolutely delightful. Salzburg is as far north as we are, I think further. But when you have nice buildings, that can work really well. 
Uh, the opposite of Salzburg, of course, is Houston. And, you know, I work in Houston, and Houston, this is old, an old picture of Houston. Houston does not look this bad anymore. But the purpose of this slide is to remind people that it is the surface parking lot that's the principal villain when it comes to eroding our urban spaces so that streets no longer feel comfortable. And it's always the surface parking that's kind of wrecking that feeling of enclosure uh, along a street. And you feel that, for example, here, uh, a very nice experience next to the library in Needham, and then, you know, this, the trees help, right? But you no longer are comfortable or, frankly, interested walking along this sidewalk. And I picked a nice one, right? There's a lot worse ones. But walking along this sidewalk in front of the, the boring parking lot, you're no longer enclosed or certainly not interested. So you look at the different public spaces, and I'm focusing on Needham here because the video, as you'll see, is on, it focuses on Newton. Um, this is Needham Center. Forgive the construction slide. And you see what you want to see in a town square, which is it's shaped on all four edges. So it really is an outdoor living room. Right? The buildings could be taller, but at least where there are a couple stories, you do feel a nice sense of enclosure. And of course, when you're against a green, it's very different from being against parking, because that's an amenity in its own right. Um, here you have Newton ha Heights. Right? Sorry, uh, uh, sorry, Needham Heights. Needham Heights, and you have another green, transit right here. And when you approach it, it's pretty comfortable, right? A nicely shaped street space. You get a little further along, taller building, that's excellent. Then you get to this corner and it all kind of falls apart because this is absolutely the wrong place for a gas station. Now, of course, gas stations are very valuable. It's hard to get rid of them. But again, if you look from the air, you can see where the space is eroded. By it. it doesn't help either that there's a big parking lot here. Here's another of these sites that could be put to better use next to a transit stop. But the, park, the, the empty corners with cars up against the green are what hurt that green. And then here you have my favorite, which is Newton Center. And I've been ranting about this for years. And I've been told that I will never get any traction with this idea. But I've never presented this idea, so let's see what happens. So this is Newton Center. Uh, the experience is very much being in a parking lot. It's the best place in Newton, apparently. Uh, it used to have a gorgeous building, a school in the center of it. Look at that. Don't feel bad. We all tore down our best buildings. That's just something that happened. Um, but now you have this, and it's called Newton Center. I would call it Central Parking Lot. But in the, in the, in the um, manner of the current spelling, I'd call it the Centriol Parking Latte. Latte. Um, but, you know, what if the parking were put underground? We put a couple layers of parking underground and put a building there. And, f sorry, I do this in half an hour today, but I'm imagining, you know, some different buildings that are, that are forming a perimeter, filling the lot, a little courtyard in the middle, go down to parking and up from parking, and we put some housing in there and maybe some offices and other things. Now we've got, I think, Newton Center. And, honestly, the difference between this and this is probably the difference between... Uh, thank you. Um, you know, the difference between this and this is probably the difference between someone being elected or not, um, <laughs> with this being the not. But uh, it's clear to anyone who does, does what I do that this is the proper, or this or something like it is the proper solution. Um, finally, the interesting walk has to do with entertaining humans, because we are, you know, among the social primates, nothing interests us more than other humans. We want signs of humanity or we will choose not to walk. Uh, we talked about one-to-one -one being the Renaissance perfect ratio of height to width. You know, here's one-to-one. -one. This is in Grand Rapids, a very walkable downtown, but no one wants to walk on this street connecting the two best hotels because when one side is a exposed parking deck and the other side is a conference facility that was apparently designed in admiration for that parking deck, then it's just, it's boring, right? It's boring. So we've learned to hide, so yeah, so we blame the architects. So um, we've learned to hide the parking deck. You know, we learned from Mayor Riley in Charleston, who was mayor for 40 years, that it only takes 20 feet of building to hide 200 feet of parking. And there's a whole bunch of these all over the world. This is the one in South Beach. I call it the Chia Pet Garage uh, in Miami you know, preserving the retail. And there's several ways to do this. You can push the building back, or you can just, this one happens to be back, but you can just activate the front, the, the first floor, as long as it's tall enough and, and not just a squat little eight-foot eight story of retail, right? 
And I want to point to someone who's doing it right, which is, don't worry, I'll be criticizing them in a minute, but the, the, um, the plan that's proposed for Needham Street um, understands this, right? And they've hidden the parking lot. What they've done with this parking lot at the center is they've put a liner, it's called a liner building. They've put a liner building at the bottom, uh, and then there's actually retail, according to this red line, there's retail at the ground level in this location, so it becomes a more walkable street. Now, there are some other areas I could point to, though, that I think need a little more attention. So, you know, here, this is the street, and the retail has chosen to put the teaser parking right out in front. But that's really kind of the old way of thinking. Like, I would put the building here, the parking is there, and hold the edge of the sidewalk, because nowadays, in the 21st century, people would rather have a street with a building right up against it than a street that's set behind a parking lot. And I wanted to call attention to one particular location because it's so easy to fix, where you have, this is, <clears throat> this is clearly meant for people to walk through because there's retail here. And this red means there's retail here. Yet the decision was made, and, and um, the developers are here, and they're good sports, and they're also told me this is an older draft, and it's, uh, it's getting to, to a newer draft. Um, but I counted this, and this is 40 parking spaces. What you've got is a street, right? A street with maybe a little bit of parking right here and there, and then a, no parking here, and then a parking lot which means that this building is set back behind this parking lot. So it's kind of a suburban condition with the parking lot in front. And of course, when the parking lot's in front, the, the driveways cross the sidewalk, right? And that's not good. So what if you just did this? What if you had a street here with parking on both sides, one way? It's a square, right? One way travel, parking both sides. One way travel, parking both sides. It's also about 40 parking spaces. But now it's a square between the two buildings. This could be green. It could be plaza. But this is something we're doing, like, all over the place, like simply saying, don't put the parking lot in front. You know, what's, what's inefficient about this is you have a way to drive and a way to drive, right? It's a redundant north-south trajectory. So if you incorporate the way to drive into the parking by having simply parallel parking on both sides of a green, that's how you get all this space to have to have that. And, of course, the trees are a really important part of the solution. So I just wanted to show that as one of a dozen ways to apply this sort of practice to a very real uh, opportunity in your community. So that's the whole, um, and I thank the developers for their patience with me. Um, that's the whole list. It's kind of scary. You have to do all four of these things simultaneously. You can't just do some of them because we humans are such a fickle species when it comes to making the choice to walk. But of course, we're getting better and better at it. Um, as those previous plans I showed you indicate. Um, so finally, just here are some resources I like to leave people with. The book, as you know, is available in the back. I look forward to meeting you as I sign it. For the junkies out there, here are the two other books that I recommend because I help write them, <laughs> um, Suburban Nation and the Smart Growth Manual. And then um, this is the TED Talk, but there's another TED Talk that's more about why, sorry, more about how, how walkable. And you can find them all on my website, which is jeffspeck.com, J-E-F-F-S-P-E-C-K.com. And I do hope that some of you will go there. And then finally, speaking of going there, um, you know George Proakis? He's the wonderful planning director of Somerville. Each year, he and I teach a course at Harvard. It's two days of this. It's in continuing ed at the design school. And a lot of people pay a lot of money to fly from other countries and parts of America to take the class, and you guys can save a lot of money because you live here. And this coming year, it's June 28 and 29 um, at, the, at Harvard. So I hope, I hope really, because I, I don't often address crowds in Boston looking you all in the eye, I hope to see some of you in this, in this class if you want to learn more about this stuff. So I'm sorry this took so long. Um, I think I'm, yes, I'm done. <laughs> you can clap. Um,